we now have a mathematical way to describe the position of a star in the celestial sphere. So we know where it is in the sky. What we need to do to finish our project is to figure out how to relate where a star is in the sky to where on Earth it's visible at what time. And so let's understand exactly what this translation process is so we can make our next move. The challenge that we have to meet is explained in this simulation. Here we have the celestial sphere again surrounding the Earth. The stars are fixed on the celestial sphere. We've equipped the celestial sphere with its equator and its prime meridian so that we can tell uh, positions of a star relative to these coordinates. And then we have an observer here at some point on Earth. We want to understand what it is that the observer sees at any given instant as the whole thing rotates. And what the observer sees is the half of the sky that is above his horizon. So his horizon is this circle here, which is an extension of uh, the plane of the Earth near where the observer is to meet the celestial sphere. And uh, this point over here is the point that he looks uh, straight up above over his head will be his zenith. And so the observer's point of view is given by this diagram, extending his horizon and then rotating to make the observer vertical. To describe where a star is, he will describe how high it is above his horizon. That's called the star's altitude. Here's a star at an altitude of 30 degrees, and here's a star at an altitude of 43 degrees. And very often we will express the same aspect of a star's position in the sky by giving instead its angular distance from the zenith. This is called the zenith angle, which is simply 90 degrees minus altitude. Once you've given either the altitude or the zenith angle, you've parameterized essentially a line of constant uh, latitude, and we need an analog of longitude. Uh, we measure local longitude away from a particular meridian. The meridian we use is the one line in the sky that uh, starts at our northern horizon, goes through our zenith, and intersects the horizon due south of us. So this is your local meridian. It splits the sky into an eastern half and a western half. And to des designate the position of a star, we measure its angular distance from this meridian moving to the east so that a star that is due east will be at azimuth 90 degrees and then various altitudes. This is how we describe to someone which way they need to look to find a star. Summarizing again, uh, our coordinates in our local view. We measure the position of a star by giving either its altitude above the horizon or its angular distance from the zenith. These two add up to 90 degrees. And its azimuth, the angle from north measuring east from 0 to 360 degrees. And then we add our special points. The zenith, the point directly overhead at altitude equal 90 degrees or zenith angle equal to 0 degrees. And the zenith has no uh, azimuth in the same way that the North Pole has no well-defined longitude. We have the horizon, the collection of all the points at altitude equals zero degrees or zenith angle equal 90 degrees. And then we had the local meridian, the line that divides the sky into an eastern and a western half. This is the line that meets the horizon in both the north and the southern points. And so this, these are all the points with azimuth equal zero degrees for the northern half from the northern horizon to the zenith, or 180 degrees for the part from the southern horizon to the zenith. That is the local meridian. These are all the stars that are neither east nor west of us. Now, what we need to understand is how to translate uh, positions on the celestial sphere in the celestial sphere coordinates to posi uh, positions in the sky in this altitude and azimuth coordinate system. And so here we have our little Earth inside a large celestial sphere. Remember, the celestial sphere should be huge. We have the poles of the celestial sphere here. We have the celestial equator over here and two diameters drawn for convenience. And so uh, we will place our observer over here at some uh, particular latitude. And this observer will come with a horizon, a half of the sky that he is able to see, and we've drawn this before. This is the line. Notice that it should go through the center of the celestial sphere because the celestial sphere is so large, and therefore this is the visible half of the sky. This is the two-dimensional version of what we did before in three dimensions, and what this makes clear 
is uh, if you look at the geometry for a moment, then this angle determining the latitude, the angle between this diameter and this line, well, this line is vertical, so perpendicular to the horizon. These two diameters have a 90 degree angle between them. The net result is that this angle here is also the observer's latitude, which means, remembering that this is the horizon, that your latitude is the angle from the horizon to whichever celestial pole is visible. In other words, if you can find the north star or the south celestial pole in your sky, you now know which direction is north or south, depending which hemisphere you're in, and you also know your latitude because the higher your latitude, the higher the pole is in the sky. Clearly, if you're at the pole, then your latitude is 90 and the pole is directly overhead. So you can use some understanding of the stars to figure out where you are and in what direction you're going. Stars are very useful for navigation. Um, the other thing that this diagram shows us is that if this observer looks directly overhead, he finds his zenith, and his zenith is over here. And what this shows us is that his zenith is at any given time going to be at a declination, a distance from the celestial equator, also equal to his latitude. And then as the Earth or the celestial sphere rotates, he will see different points on this line of fixed declination directly overhead. So the only points that are directly overhead ever for a given observer are the points whose declination is equal to your latitude. Here we have our favorite view of the sky in Athens again. And in addition to the green celestial grid that I drew before, centered on the north celestial pole, I've drawn in red uh, our local altitude and azimuth grid. And so we see our zenith directly overhead. We see lines of constant altitude in concentric circles around it. And we see lines of constant azimuth. And as you see, uh, we are looking due south at the moment. And so this is our prime meridian, the line that splits the sky into an eastern half over here and a western half over there. And because the prime meridian uh, goes through both the zenith and whichever celestial pole is visible, because it, in this case, uh, reaches the northern horizon, it coincides with some specific celestial meridian for its long part, for the part including the zenith. At this point, I think that I can tell that because this is zero hour mer celestial meridian, this is the two hour celestial meridian, our local meridian corresponds with the uh, celestial meridian for one hour. And when I allow time to elapse, then as we saw, the green grid on which the stars are fixed will move from east to west, rotating about the celestial pole. The red grid, which is fixed to us, will appear to us to be stationary. So as time goes by, the celestial lines of celestial meridians will move to the east, and whereas the lines of fixed azimuth will not, so that if our local meridian corresponded previously to uh, the meridian for one uh, hour of right ascension, now we have two hours of right ascension overhead, three hours, and so on and so forth.